We're moving on from the body, contemplation of the body, and all of the inside aspects of the body practice are in the realization that however you want to look at the body, it is a impermanent, unsatisfactory, and devoid of substance. Uh, so that is the insight aspect of these practices. And the samatha practice is that such things as mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of the four postures. Uh, that is, uh, by the way, the, the four postures are uh, this sampajanya, this uh, being uh, aware of the, uh, the panoramic awareness of life in motion. And the uh, stages of decomposition of the body and the uh, body as 32 parts, the body as four elements, these are all to restructure your perception. And so, in fact, we're bringing in another khanda or aspect. There are five sort of aspects of a human. The Buddha summarizes. One of them is the body. And another one is perception. So we're actually starting to alter perceptions about the body. And we're doing it in a very deliberate, systematic exercise. We are scrutinizing it and re structuring the way we see it and the way we inform ourselves about it. And we have to do this until it becomes the default mode of how we see the body. So this is a retraining and you'll have to more or less trust the Buddha on this because uh, it goes sharply against the normal discourse in society about the nature of the body. There's a lot of lamentation and horror around the dead body, and there's a lot of politeness and reserve around the living body, and a more or less training of perception in each culture. The perception, how you're supposed to view the body, is a cultural matter. So we're undoing this, and this is perception. And this is good to have, to become a virtuoso of perception. The Buddha gives, uh, I think, Sariputta as an example of uh, a virtuoso of perception. He says that Sariputta can observe a block of wood, and he can observe it, he can see it as ugly, as beautiful, or as neither. Interesting. So he can adjust, he can decide what his perception is of various objects. And you notice that this is also the case for, say, a, um, a pathologist, somebody who works with uh, disease or dead bodies, uh, coroners, funeral directors, they hopefully have changed their perceptions about the nature of the body after death, and uh, they don't necessarily see it as scary or repulsive. Then they can go home to their wife or their husband. And uh, part of them knows that their body has the same characteristics, so they're able to adjust their perceptions. So we should also uh, strive to adjust our perceptions. So this is an area that is not, it's not so explicit in the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness really deal with uh, the body, feelings, mind as such, or what we would call moods, and then dhamma drop-down menus or categories of teachings. Structures of teachings is the last category, but uh, what is uh, brought into this in almost all of these cases is perception and the reshaping of perception. So you have much more control over how you wish to view each situation. So this is part of uh, insight, 
and insight accomplished. It's accomplished when it's wisdom, and it means that it's at the service of non-suffering or uh, happiness, well-being. Your perceptions are restructured, re-engineered to serve your well-being. And you get to reframe the world in new ways. And by that, you become empowered. On to feelings. So feelings are of two kinds. So one, uh, those which are derived from the body, the sensations in the body, uh, merely through contact, through touch. And then there's psychological feelings, uh, which are derived as a result of mental experience and also sensory experience. And there is another kind of uh, a feeling, which is what we would call spiritual feeling. The kind of pleasures that one who is a renunciate, one who has left the ordinary world of sensory pleasures, which uh, sometimes called the household life, and gone into a world which is not uh, conducive to uh, sensual happiness, but nevertheless, mysteriously, perhaps, from the point of view of the world, the renunciant uh, can appear to be uh, experiencing great pleasure. So these, uh, all of these are types of feelings, so body feelings, bodily mirror, you know, for, as a result of touch, and then uh, various types of uh, sensory, emotionally de de derived feelings. Uh, these are feelings which are derived from uh, sights, sounds, smells, taste, touches, and ideas as well. So, of course, you're familiar with the pleasure of music, perhaps. Um, and uh, so that's uh, a pleasant feeling which is derived from sound, uh, etc. So, uh, certain sights uh, give a pleasant, are accompanied by pleasant feeling, etc. So these are all ways of uh, experiencing sensations. There are whole schools of um, meditation, uh, vipassana type uh, structures, which uh, have taken a, uh, a phrase from the Buddha, which is called, uh, all things converge in feelings a phrase which seems to indicate that basically if you only have one uh, topic for insight, it would be feelings. I would not get carried away by that. The Buddha does this throughout the suttas. He seems to be making a final declarative statement about something, but then you find out that he says in other parts, other things all things converge in other aspects, other, all things converge in consciousness, uh, etc. So uh, feelings are extremely important. And in some sense, there would be uh, no suffering without them. And much suffering is because of the transient, fickle nature of feelings. But uh, it's possible to find a state which is beyond feeling and still uh, you are not finished with, the, uh, with suffering. There are states called beyond, uh, cessation of perception and feeling which are not necessarily um, uh, Nibbana. So, um, Feelings have to be uh, explored, and here's an example of a dialogue between a layperson and a, and a monk, a junior monk, who are very interested. They're Dhamma comrades. They probably knew each other before the monk ordained. It's a, the, one of the fellows is a, is a carpenter, and the monk has perhaps a, 
a year in the robes, and they're having a chat about Dhamma. And the carpenter says, uh, I heard that, that there are only two types of feeling, painful and pleasant. The young monk says, no, there are three kinds of feelings, painful, neutral, and pleasant. And then back and forth they go uh, in a very amiable way, very respectful way, trying to, because they both are sure that they heard this, and they're very uh, devoted students of the Buddha. Uh, they really want to get this right. And it's not quite a, what we would call an argument, it's a Dhamma discussion. So finally they decide, well, let's go to the Buddha and find out, like, because I swear, I, I heard him just say it was two, and, and I swear I heard it say, said it was three. So this is, this is actually a very good dialogue for um, realizing that the Buddha, you, you don't want to jump to conclusions uh, when you come across passages that say there are two types of feelings. Just hold on. <laughs> or passages that says there are three types of feelings in the you think exclusively, that is right in there, right in the print. Uh, so they go to the Buddha and he says, uh, we, we were having a, they, they say they're having a discussion about these feelings and the Buddha says, what, what did you say? And he said, well, I heard you say that there are two kinds of feelings, pleasant and painful. And the Buddha says, I, indeed I did say that. And uh, uh, the monk, so, uh, is a little bit taken aback by that. And he said, but Venerable, sir, I, I heard you say there were three types of feelings, pleasant, painful, and neutral. And the Buddha said, yeah, I did say that. <laughs> and they're looking at each other and he said, I, I said both of those things because both of the thing, those things are true. You can, you can summarize feelings as, uh, you can categorize neutral feelings as painful, or you can categorize them as pleasant. They could fall into a different, depending on what preceded them. So neutral feeling following on painful feeling is felt as pleasant feeling. Neutral feeling following pleasant feeling is felt as painful feeling. So when the the ice cream, the joy of the ice cream ends, you're left with a neutral feeling, but it seems to be inadequate. On the other hand, if you're very, very thirsty and you have a glass of water and the, the, the thirst goes away, that's a pleasant feeling. But if you're not that thirsty and you just have a glass of water, it's rather a, a neutral feeling. So this neutral feeling can uh, appear as painful or pleasant, and you could classify them that way, or you could classify them as all three. The Buddha goes on to say, he says, if you think this is complex, there are actually 108 feelings. Shall I take the time to enumerate them? <laughs> no. <laughs> but roughly, <laughs> it is that uh, and this is kind of, uh, this is a more or less a primitive form of what's called Abhidhamma. And those who are attending this retreat and are new to this, you don't have to worry about Abhidhamma. It's the third section of the Pali Canon, and it's a, it's a kind of a enumeration. It's the, what perhaps university professors would do with, a score by Beethoven um, when they're turning it into the physics of music or something like that. They, it's, a, it's a complete uh, dissection of the Dhamma into basic elements. But, and some, some people uh, find it beneficial and others just set it aside. Uh, it's unlikely that the Buddha said that in his life. Uh, it was probably a production of monks after the Buddha's death. However, uh, you find suttas that are kind of uh, uh, spinning out, uh, unpacking, uh, analyzing these things. So the Buddha talks about. So there are 
there are uh, feelings which are established on sights. So a sight may be accompanied by a pleasant feeling, neutral feeling, or painful feeling. A sound may be accompanied by pleasant, painful, neutral. So you have six senses, and each of them could have three possibilities. There you have 18. And uh, they could be also of the mind or of the, of, uh, the body. And now you have 36, and then they could be of the past, the future, or the present, 108 uh, sort of things like that. So you can see that you can spend time uh, seeing how pervasive feeling is in your life. So you're anticipating feelings in the future. A, lot, a huge amount of your motivation in life is is because you've got plans for having pleasant feelings in the future. Or you have a dread of having painful feelings in the future. Maybe that's why you don't go to a 10-day retreat where you have to sit on a bench all the time and your knees are going to hurt you. You just want to avoid that. But you'd like to, be, you'd like to hear the information so you stay home. And it's, it's much more pleasant this way, isn't it? <laughs> uh, or you, you go to the retreat because you are anticipating that it's going to be a wonderful experience. You'll get away from your normal uh, distractions of life and have the beautiful, spacious, and supportive conditions of the monastery. And uh, you, in particular, don't get any knee pains when you sit in meditation. You only get uh, pleasant uh, sensations. So you're looking forward to it. So we're, our life is full of uh, looking forward to things, sensory things, sensual things, and then spiritual things. And we're also dreading uh, the deprivation of the senses and sometimes the deprivation of our, of our spiritual well-being as well. Because sometimes, uh, especially if, the, if your practice is not going well, it's very easy for uh, pleasant feelings which you have experienced on occasion in your practice to decline or, or perhaps you can't get them back. This is a very common experience. People go to uh, meditation retreats and have what's called beginner's luck. They have a breakthrough into uh, beautiful uh, states of mind which are absolutely entrancing and uh, that changes them. Uh, However, once you leave the retreat and you mingle, by the way, how do you lose the pleasant uh, spiritual uh, feelings? Generally, and people ask me at the end of retreats, they, ha they have find, found their way into this beautiful, pleasant abiding. And they come to me at the end of the retreat, realizing they've got to face life now outside the monastery, outside the retreat center. And they ask me, how do I keep this going? How do I keep this blissful, pleasant, spiritual state going? I usually say to them, well, I, I, I won't tell you how to, how to keep it going, but I will tell you how you're going to lose it. And it won't be because of traffic. It won't be because of trees or the weather or even your pet dog. It will be because of people. <laughs> and which people? Those close to you, <laughs> your relatives, <laughs> your dear ones. That is how you will lose it because they, they have a very strong, uh, you have a strong um, conditioning with them. And so it's, it, you are forced back into a, a worldly perceptions often. And the decline of this beautiful, spiritual, pleasant feeling occurs. Because the power of your conditioning, and it's the most powerful conditioning is those are, are humans who, who uh, know you well and that you know well. Now, you may be fortunate to uh, go back to a circle of acquaintances which are very spiritual and uplifting, and uh, in that case, you, you will be able to maintain that lifestyle. But 
supportive conditions for the maintenance of pleasant spiritual feelings are the reason why the Buddha establishes such a thing as the Sangha, why people take ordination, why they leave the household life, why they go off to the, to the life of the recluse, to the life of solitude, the life of spiritual investigation, is because that, those conditions are more supportive of this uh, pleasant uh, abiding. And in fact, uh, the phrase pleasant abiding in, in the Pali version is, uh, is given in some of these states, which we would call jhanas, samadhi states. A pleasant abiding here and now. So, these are, this is the incredible universe of feelings. Primary thing is that many, many people do, are not aware of any sort of idea of happiness outside of basic uh, sensory uh, experience. So when they think, and then there's a limit to that. So some people are not uh, intellectual, they don't have much of an intellectual life. So they would be restricted to sensory experiences of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And even the, uh, there is kind of a hierarchy of, of sense experience where sight and sound are higher senses and then smell and taste and touch are uh, lower uh, sensory experiences. So even to process uh, refined uh, the beauty of sights and sounds, such as uh, sophisticated music, or even the sound of nature, uh, and then the sight of art, and uh, appreciation of, uh, of all kinds of uh, visual beauty, uh, nature as well requires a certain uh, development of personality. And so there's a various uh, levels of um, uh, sensory happiness. But uh, sensory happiness is, and it, it basically is uh, where the majority of uh, humanity uh, finds their happiness. And it, it's rather unsatisfactory because it's very hard to maintain that. I mean. If you're really hungry and you are served some very, very good food, it's a wonderful experience and it can go on for an hour or two, but eventually you're full. <laughs> and then you've run out. And now you're left with neutral feeling after pleasant feeling. And what's that? That's painful feeling. <laughs> so you feel now bereft of your happiness because the happiness was in the taste and the satisfaction of hunger. So, by the way, so the uh, hunger is a painful feeling, and then if it's followed by some sort of food, it is not merely a neutral feeling, it's experienced as, the, the absence of hunger is experienced as pleasant. So, <clears throat> then you need to go to another sensory experience. And I mean, so after the dinner, maybe you need to go to a show where you can hear music and you can see sights. Uh, then uh, eventually that, you can't continuously do that either. That must uh, end. And then you need to go home and go to sleep. And the next day you wake up and then you have to do, find some stimulation all over because the only experience of happiness is through the senses. So your day has to start again with seeking sights, sounds, smells, taste, touches, and looking for pleasant uh, sensations in them. That's a somewhat, that's a, a lot of work. Uh, that, by the way, is called the monkey mind. And uh, you will have heard this perhaps in your readings or in Dhamma talks, monkey mind uh, being usually referred to as restlessness, as a kind of a restlessness, but actually it's not restlessness. The monkey of the, the monkey in the forest, and remember that the, uh, 
these suttas come from India where monkeys are plentiful. Uh, <clears throat> it may not be obvious to Canadians uh, the behavior of monkeys unless you've been to the forest, but um, in, uh, in the tropics. Monkeys spend a lot of their time swinging from branch to branch. Why do they do this? Is it for exercise? <laughs> uh, somewhat. <laughs> uh, is it mere playfulness? Is it mere restlessness? No, actually monkeys are not really restless. They are looking for fruit. They are looking for food. And in order to find it, they have these wonderfully developed arms that allow them to swing through the forest. They let go of one branch to grab to another. They let go of that branch to grab to another. So that is the idea of monkey mind. The monkey mind is that which grabs from one type of consciousness, the con sight consciousness, lets go of that to grab to sound consciousness, to smell, to taste, to touch, to idea consciousness, various types of consciousness. One is the mind is seeking, the consciousness is seeking pleasant sensations uh, in the sensory experience. So that is the monkey mind, the monkey mind. This is what we are t attempting to, in a uh, uh, meditation retreat, we're attempting to uh, focus our minds and keep them on a uh, single subject, say uh, a very non-sensory, a very neutral subject, such as the breath. Oh, it seems that we have trouble. Our mind thinks, I wonder what's for lunch. I wonder what, what, if the sky is blue outside. Or it has a memory. It remembers that just before it went to the monastery, it discovered a new song which was, had a, a really catchy um, melody in it. Or it begins to anticipate, when I go home, I'm going to stop along the way to get my favorite Krispy Kreme donuts. Um, so the mind is having trouble the monkey mind is having trouble staying with this neutral object such as the breath or meditating on the 32 parts of the body or the four elements. It's having trouble with this because that's the nature of the sensory mind. It is re relentless and must, must uh, find its happiness in the changing senses. And each sense, you're familiar with this phrase, jaded. The, uh, jaded means that your one sense or another burns out because it's been overused. And so you are not getting the same uh, appreciation. A pleasant, pleasant sensation has turned to neutral sensation. And neutral sensation after pleasant sensation can be painful sensation. So this, that which pleased you yesterday, which you overindulged in, you ate too much pizza, you cannot face pizza today. You drank too much yesterday, and you cannot face it today. You overdid it. And now that, that option is gone. So th this is the the problematic nature of sensory happiness. And this uh, phrase, the monkey mind, is very, very important to see. So you can watch your own, uh, your own nature to swing through the uh, sensory experiences. There are people uh, who are intellectual types <clears throat> um, who are more interested in ideas and they, they often think of themselves as non-sensual. They kind of feel like they're a little bit uh, monkish uh, because they don't seem to need... Uh, they can ignore the food and, and uh, the entertainment and so forth because they're preoccupied with their ideas. But that turns out another... It's just another type of uh, sensual uh, dependency on new ideas. And you discover a new thinker, a new philosophy, a new book, a new novel, um, uh, some new, new ways of new ideas and so forth, and you're enthralled for a period of time. But eventually also that you come to the end of it, you come to the end of that wonderful book, the, the great Tolstoy novel or the 
the Kurt Vonnegut novel or whatever you're reading and you put it down but, and you, you think that was just such a wonderful experience, but it won't be long before you're thinking, and now what? So this happens uh, in the, uh, the sixth sense, which is the intellect and ideas. And uh, that is, a lot of people are not aware of that. Those who are inclined to this uh, intellectual bent, uh, they, they think they, they can probably do quite well at, uh, at a monastery in, or in a low sensory environment, but uh, they really are dependent on uh, their sensory hit from uh, thought processes and or art projects. So art is, as well is a sensory dependency of the mind. These, uh, these realms, by the way, uh, these kind of uh, understanding this is, is kind of unpacked in uh, Buddhist cosmology. This, the sensory world is uh, explained, and it, it's everything from the, uh, there, are, there are six sensory heavens, six six sensual heavens. And they go all the way up to creativity and art at the top and have all kinds of uh, um, pleasant indulgence. You can imagine them as, as uh, heavens, you know, places that you visit. And uh, these are fully kind of explained and articulated in uh, Buddhist cosmology. And they show you the nature of human consciousness and it's everything from there down into the human realm. And then even the, the animal realm is still uh, involved in uh, sensuality. And then there are realms of deprivation, which uh, the ghostly realms, etc. And so uh, what is primarily the deprivation is the lack of the ability to in enjoy sense pleasure, uh, the lack of ability to, en to experience joy at all. And that might be because of the sense, some aspect of the sensory, the external sense is missing, or the consciousness, the sense consciousness is not capable of it. So this is a huge area which the vast majority of beings are in, in, in this type of consciousness. Above that are the states of uh, spiritual pleasure. And these are called the jhanic um, realms. Uh, so these are uh, realms which are entered only through meditation, and they involve putting aside the pleasures of the senses. So one withdraws from the pleasures of the senses, focuses on, say, a neutral object, such as the breath, and then it begins to experience exquisite pleasures long, sustained, exquisite pleasures which are only, uh, have no apparent source. From the ordinary person's perception, they don't understand why a person sitting still with their eyes closed, breathing, is experiencing rapturous uh, bliss, joy, uh, and uh, pleasure of the body. Why, how? Why would they be experiencing something like that? They're not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And they're not, if, if the report is correct, then they're not even indulging in thought. They're not, they're not remembering some pleasure. They're not anticipating some pleasure. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is another realm of pleasure, and this is going up the scale of refined pleasures. And this, uh, these are, again, uh, sensory experiences. This is under this uh, mindfulness of feelings. One is aware of them. It is their nature, by the way. So this is where it's important, and I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, the fact that, that these sensations in uh, deep uh, meditation are also intrinsically impermanent does not mean that we have a neutral attitude towards them, that, we are, that we're indifferent to them. 
Uh, the Buddha is very clear that one should cultivate these things, and that this is um, <clears throat> this uh, sensory, uh, this uh, meditative pleasure, is a pleasure not to be feared. And this is one of the discoveries that he makes as a bodhisattva just before his enlightenment. He has withdrawn from painful practices. Here we go again with the sensory, the the sensory practice of pain, which was thought to be beneficial. He had been doing uh, extreme fasting and all kinds of subjecting the body to uh, difficulties and, and pain, had finally realized that this was just uh, not humane. It was not good. It was not kind. It was ignoble. It did not have great benefits. And he remembers an experience of meditation as a child, and he goes back to that, and it happens to be breath, breath meditation, and he experiences bliss, pleasant bliss. He's now, the body is at ease. Uh, he is in the shade, there's a beautiful breeze coming across the river, and he is experiencing bliss, and he says to himself, this is a pleasure not to be feared. So in certain schools, you, f you hear this emphasis on uh, not to, to more or less almost avoid the pleasure of uh, samadhi. But this is not the case for the, the Buddha. The, Bu <clears throat> the Buddha integrates the, the nature of Buddhism, uh, what makes it distinct from other uh, religious practices, that it's, it is that it's, it's a samatha vipassana practice. It's... it's uh, clarity of mind based on profound stillness and serenity. And it's the conjunction of these two. So the eighth factor of the path is this samadhi practice, which has, uh, is one of the fruits of the path. This is another sutta in the same collection as we're talking about now. Uh, we're talking about the Maha Satipatthana Sutta in uh, in the longer length discourses. This is uh, Sutta tw uh, 22. Uh, this whole retreat is on this, but there's another Sutta in that collection, the longer length collections, and that is uh, the fruits of uh, recluseship, uh, the fruits of the spiritual path. And so one of the fruits of the spiritual path is the encounter with the, the ex exquisite pleasure of, of true meditative uh, attainment. So samadhi, and the pleasure uh, which accompanies samadhi is a fruit of the practice, a beautiful fruit of the practice. So we want to integrate this idea that uh, the instructions in uh, this Four Foundations of Mindfulness regarding feelings is that the nature of feelings is transient, etc. But it doesn't mean that you are to have a dismissive uh, uh, attitude towards all feelings, or that you are to avoid pleasant feelings which arise through the uh, through samadhi. So this is not the case. So uh, this is a, just a kind of an introduction to this uh, area of feelings, and I will continue to talk about it uh, in the next talk. Uh, as I say, the feelings are a universe in themselves, and and really outside. It, the, there is, it's very difficult to conceive of much in the way of experience without accompanied by feeling. So we will uh, continue with this analysis tomorrow.